one day I on the triumphal entry of Christ, amen? But the week before that, which is next Sunday, Brother Johnson will be with us, and I don't know what he's preaching on. Lord, move on his heart to preach on that. And so these first two weeks in uh, March here, I wanted to preach on a couple of, uh, a couple of messages that kind of show us the buildup, the context that leads to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And of course, there are a lot of things we could preach uh, regarding that, but this is one passage that I think will kind of help us understand some of these things. And of course, this is the passage regarding the resurrection of Lazarus, all right? And I know that is a very, very familiar passage to you, and uh, one that you say, boy, I could probably quote all of that to you, and you probably could. But as we've studied this last Sunday morning and last Sunday night, uh, we've seen there's a lot more in there uh, than maybe we realize. And I was intending on finishing this up tonight, but when Brother Plot said he was able to come, I said, hey, that's great. So I'm excited, but that means I got to get it all in one, all right? So you listen fast and I'll preach fast, amen? But there's some, some wonderful things in here I want you to see. Now, just to get our bearings again, John chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. Verse 3 says, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And of course, you know what happens. Uh, the Lord waits and tells his disciples uh, that he is sleeping. And he said, let's go wake him up. And they said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he's doing well. He said, no. He said, listen, guys, he's dead. <laughs> and uh, he just lays that out to him. And he says uh, in uh, verse number 15, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent you may believe. And nevertheless, let us go unto him. And you know, he gets there and Martha comes out and talks to him. And uh, he says, hey, your brother, uh, verse number 23, thy brother shall I'll rise again. And uh, she talks about the resurrection of life. We're going to get into that here in just, or she talks about the resurrection uh, to come. And uh, we're going to get into that. But our text is found in verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. The title of this series is The Resurrection and the life. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, that you are the resurrection and the life, and that we can be saved. Lord, even if we die before the rapture happens and our body is placed in the tomb, Lord, you're going to raise us up at the last day, at that trumpet. So, Lord, we thank you for that. But at the same time, Lord, we find so many truths uh, for living in here, and we pray that you'd help us as we study this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to pick up kind of where we left off. We were looking at verse 20 and following. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. And uh, she goes to see the Lord. Uh, then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Now it's a good thing that Martha recognized that the Lord, uh, could raise her brother up. Amen. She had, she had some good understanding. Uh, she said in, uh, in verse 24, Mark said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. So she has some good doctrine. Amen. Uh, she's got good faith in the Lord. She's got some good doctrine. But she assumes that if Jesus had been there before Lazarus died, that he would have healed her. Well, I can tell you that he would not have healed her. Because we know, or healed him, we know that because it was not the Father's will that he heal him, but that he raise him from the dead. And so that's why the Lord said, I'm glad I wasn't there. Can you imagine if he's there on his deathbed dying, and the people are looking at Jesus saying, well, Lord, heal him, hurry, he's going to die. And him standing there saying, I can't, can't do that. Boy, they would have thought, boy, you're cold hearted. Why aren't you doing this? But because he was away, remember he was in Bethabara about a day's journey away, there was no way, humanly speaking, that he could have gotten there. Now, of course, he can heal from a distance and all of that. But he says, I'm glad I wasn't there in, to the intent that you might believe. But she just comes and she says, if you had been here, you would have healed him. Hey, we don't need to presume upon the Lord. We don't need to tell the Lord what he should have done. You know, in reality, Martha is telling the Lord, you made a mistake. Because if you'd have been here, you would have healed him and you didn't come. And, so, and we know that's impossible. The Lord never makes mistakes. 
But sometimes when things happen in our life, we think to ourselves, Lord, why did you let that happen? Lord, if you had just allowed this to happen, that wouldn't have happened. If you had opened this door over here, this wouldn't have happened. And what we're doing is saying, Lord, you missed it. You made a mistake. You got things wrong. Hey, the fact is, he is always right. Whether we understand it or not, whether we like it or not, he's always right. Martha here comes to him and says, hey, uh, you should have done this. Look at verse 23. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So Jesus makes a simple declarative statement that Lazarus is going to rise again. Now if you were here Sunday night, I already went over this, but I just want to remind you where we're at here. He says, your brother will rise again. Can I tell you that if a person has died in the Lord, they knew the Lord as their personal Savior, you can go up to their loved ones and tell them the same thing that the Lord told Martha about Lazarus. They will rise again. Amen. Now, of course, the Lord knows he's going to raise Lazarus in just a few moments, but he also knew that he would raise him again in the rapture. And so whether your friend lives or dies, if they're saved, they will rise again. That's a truth that we can tell them. It's true. And so he tells her this, but then she says, well, Lord, I know he's going to rise at the last day. So again, she's got some good doctrine here. But notice what the Lord says. Again in 25 and 26, Jesus saith unto him, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Do you remember what he told Thomas? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I've come to show you the way, or tell you the truth, or demonstrate the life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Hey, Jesus doesn't tell us to believe a certain teaching of his or just to believe that he can show us the way of life. You know, some guru might tell you, hey, here's my teaching. If you follow my teaching, then you'll find enlightenment or nirvana or whatever. Jesus didn't say that. He said, it's not just believing in my teaching, it's believing in me. He said, I am the way, the truth, the resurrection, and the life. Hey, it's all about Jesus. Outside of him, there is no salvation. There is no resurrection. There is no life. Hey, there is no truth outside of him. Jesus said of himself in Revelation 21, verse 6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He's the beginning and end of what? Of everything. In the beginning, God. He doesn't say, in the beginning, here's where God came from and this, that. No, he just begins. God was already here. <laughs> and he will be here forever. He is the beginning. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Ephesians 1.23 says, he filleth all in all. Hebrews 12.2 says that he is the author and finisher of our faith. Don tells us that without Jesus was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1.17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Hey, Martha was not just talking to some healer here. She is speaking to the creator of the universe who holds every molecule in his hand. He is the beginning and the end. He is the way, the truth, the resurrection, and the life. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He fills all in all, and she proposes to tell him what he should have done. When we get that mindset, we begin to say, Oh, wait a minute, Lord, I'm sorry. <laughs> Far be it for me to tell you what you should have done. He knows it all. He, he knows the beginning and the end. You know, it's interesting, of course, he is omniscient, which means he knows all. But don't forget, he is not bound by time like we are. We go through our life, we say, hey, I'm entering this trial, this challenge right now, and uh, Lord, I hope you can get me through this. I, I don't know, Lord, what, do you know what's coming on the other end? The Lord's not in the same timeline as you are. He's already there. He already knows where you're going. And he has prepared a way. And he has prepared your steps in between there to grow you in that way. And for him to get glory. And Jesus says that he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. 
So not only does Jesus promise to raise the dead in him to life, but that they will never die again. Jesus said in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Everlasting life is a present possession. You don't get everlasting life when you die. You begin your everlasting life the moment you're saved. You have everlasting life. So Jesus makes that simple statement. If you believe in him, he'll raise you from the dead and one day and you'll never die again. But then he asks a simple question. He says, believest thou this? See that at the end of verse 26? That's what we need to ask people. When we witness to them, we give them the gospel. It's one thing to tell them how to be saved and help them to understand it. But they have to come to the point to where they believe it. That's what matters. Notice the Lord Jesus Christ himself, literally the living word, has just explained this truth to Martha, but he didn't leave it there. He didn't say, okay, I've explained it to you, now you're good to go. No, he said, now ball's in your court. Do you believe what I've said? For by grace are you saved. That's God's part through faith. That's your part. It's not a work. We don't do anything for salvation, but we have faith in what he has already done. There must be faith there. And Martha gives the right answer. She says, yea, Lord, I believe. And that's what we want to hear. We're witnessing to somebody that, that they believe. And then she, went, she goes further. She said that she believed he was the Christ, which means the anointed one, the Messiah, and that he was the Son of God. That is, that he is God. She knew he was the one who had been long foretold. You notice that Jesus always brings the conversation back to himself. When he met the woman at the well, she started trying to talk about religion and he brings it back to him. Hey, that's what you ought to do too. You witness to someone, they won't get you off on a ride. What about this and what about that? You need to bring it all back to Christ. It's all about him. Now let's look at verse 28 and following. He says, And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now, Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. There's a lot in here. You remember the, the other account with Mary and Martha? Jesus and his disciples were visiting their home there in Bethany, and Martha was busy cooking and preparing and setting the table and getting everything ready. What was Mary doing? Sitting at the feet of Jesus. And you remember Martha comes to the Lord and in Luke 10, 40 he says, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. How foolish to ask the Lord, don't you care? That's like the men. You remember when the disciples are on the ship and, and the storm is raging and the Lord is asleep in the hinder part of the ship and they said, carest thou not that we perish? No one has ever cared more for you than the Lord Jesus Christ. No one has cared more for you, Martha, than the Lord has. But there is an appropriate time and place for everything. And in that house, it was the time to sit and listen to the Lord. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So we know the character of Mary and Martha, and we see that on display in this account. Now, Martha was a woman of action, right? Verse 28 says that as soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. And when she comes to him, what does she do? She tells him, hey, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. But that even now, she says, hey, even now you can, you can raise him up. She goes and then tells Mary that Jesus has come and that he wants to see her. And Mary gets up quickly and she goes to him. Now notice, she had stayed in the house until the Lord called for her. Martha had jumped up at the first moment and goes to see him. Now she goes to him quickly. And verse 32 says that when she saw him, she fell down at his feet. 
Now Mary is always found at the feet of Jesus. It's where we find her. Remember, very soon in the account, in the chronology in John here, we will see her anointing his feet with ointment and wiping it with the hairs of her head. And here as well, notice she says the same thing as her sister. She says, uh, Martha and Mary, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But we get the impression that Martha's tone was almost accusatory. She comes to him, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. We already said we don't need to presume upon the Lord. We don't need to accuse him of doing something wrong. Mary says the same thing, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. But notice where she's at. She's at his feet. It's not the same tone. She's recognizing that he is Lord. And what is she doing? She's expressing to him that she doesn't understand. We get the idea of Martha saying, why didn't you come and heal him? And Mary's saying, Lord, I don't understand why you didn't come and heal him. She's broken hearted. He knows she's broken hearted. He knows she doesn't understand. Hey, Psalm 103 verse 14 says, For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. He knows that we don't understand everything he does or why we do them. But if we will come to him humbly, that's the difference. We can ask him our questions. We can ask him about why he's doing what he's doing or why he's allowing things in our life. Listen, it's okay to have questions. He understands that. It is not okay to accuse God of doing wrong or of not being in control. But if you will come to him humbly and say, Lord, I know you're in control. I know that all you do is right, but I just don't understand why this is going on. I'm not accusing you of doing wrong. And if you choose not to answer me, that's okay too. I will still choose to trust you. And I'll still choose to believe that what you're doing is good and right. But if it's okay, I'd like to know why you've done this. You know, he may or may not give you an answer, but he will not condemn you for coming to him in that way. Hey, there's another Mary that has a similar situation. You remember Zacharias the priest when the angel came to him and said, you're going to have a baby? He said, how's this going to happen? And the angel said, all right, fine, I'm going to strike you dumb until it happens. And he walked out not able to talk. Then the same angel goes to Mary. You're going to have a baby. How can this happen? Let me explain it to you. Same question, different attitude. What'd she say? Behold the handmaid of the Lord. It's not wrong to have questions. God expects us to have questions. It's in how we come to him. Look at verse 33 again. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping which came with her. Notice he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. That word groan means he literally physically was shaking. The emotions that he had. Hey listen, God created you as a triune being. Body, soul, and spirit. And that soul is made up of the intellect, emotion, and will. Your emotion is something God has given you. Too many people say, well, I'm so spiritual, I'm not going to cry at this situation. That's not right. That's pride. It's okay to cry. He gave us that. And do you realize that when we finally break down and cry and allow that to come through, then we're more willing and able and likely to come before him and say, I can't do this on my own. I need you. Lord, honestly, I love you. I know you're always right, but I don't understand. Will you help me? By the way, if he's going to give you an answer, it's found in this book. Don't go to him and say, Lord, now why are you doing this? And then just go about your, your day. I'm waiting for him to write it in the sky or something. No, you ask a question, you go to the book. That's how he answers. We study the word of God. But we have to understand that we are emotional creatures. We see Jesus here. He groaned in the spirit and he's troubled. Then verse 34, and he said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Now verse 35, shortest verse in our English Bible, but what power? Jesus wept. Don't tell me you're so spiritual you don't cry when Jesus wept. Hey, boy, you realize who you really are and what God has done for you. Boy, it ought to break your heart and get a hold of you. Realize what he's doing for you every day. Nothing wrong with that. Jesus 
wept. Hebrews 4 verse 15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's one of the reasons it was so important that he became a man. Number one, he had to take on flesh and be a man so he could die for our sin, but also so he could experience life the way we do. He knows. He understands. Don't ever be ashamed to show that emotion. But in the emotion, you say, listen, I understand it's tough, and I, I don't understand all the reasoning, but I believe God is good. God was good before this happened. God's good now. He's going to be good afterwards. And it's all for His glory. And by the way, don't stand by someone who's crying over a trial and think, well, I thought they were spiritual. Well, they're all upset over this. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice. And weep with them that weep. Nothing wrong with weeping with someone. Now before we move on to the action of the story, notice verse number 37. Well look at verse 36. Then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. You see that's when that emotion comes out, it shows where your heart is. And they saw that he loved him. Verse 37 says, And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? You know, we understand why lost people ask the question why God does what He does or allows what He allows. The unsaved person, listen carefully, the unsaved person thinks of God as some kind of a genie who is just supposed to grant us all our wishes and smooth all our roads so that we never have a problem. And when they see believers having a problem, they don't understand and they ask, well, why did your God let you go through that? If he really is all powerful and all loving, why would you ever go through anything like that or suffer? But again, they're not saved. They have no faith. They don't understand. But we who are saved and have walked with the Lord for a while have learned that God uses trials in our life to shape us and mold us. In our Sunday school lesson, we're studying through the book of James, and this is probably one of the most familiar passages James 1, verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That word temptation is not an enticement to evil. It means trials and testings when you fall into diverse temptations. Why? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That's what the trials do. We learn that diverse temptations, the various trials that we face, works patience in our lives. And patience makes us mature in Christ. You remember when the Lord told Paul that he was not going to remove the thorn in the flesh? You remember three times Paul said, I prayed, Lord, would you remove this thorn in the flesh? And finally, the Lord said, no, I'm not going to do that. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And what did Paul learn? He said, most gladly, therefore... Well, I rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He said, I've learned that this, this thorn in the flesh, we don't know what it was. Many believe it was an eye uh, condition that he had. It could have been all kinds of, but whatever it was, the Lord says, no, I'm not taking it away from you. My grace is sufficient. And he said, oh, you know what I've learned? This has made me weak. And when I am weak, then I am strong because I rely on him. And he has done something in me that could not have happened if I was relying on myself. He said, I'll rather glory. So while the world may not understand why God doesn't take away all of our troubles, you and I know that He loves us. Listen, He loves us too much to let us go without the things that strengthen our faith. Listen, you, you might drive by a gym. People are in there working out. And somebody walks out, they're sweating to death and they're all sore and everything. You walk by, man, you're crazy. What do you go and do that for? But he's stronger than you are because he went through the trials in that. You can drive by that gym every day, never have a problem, never have to worry about working out, never get any stronger. But it is the trials, it's the workout that builds the strength. And he knows that. Listen carefully to this. As our faith grows, we should go from praying, Lord, get me out of this, to Lord, get me through this. To Lord, grow me in this. To Lord, get glory from this. 
See, when we're first saved and we have our first problem, our first thing, oh, I'm a Christian now, God, all right, Lord, get me out of this. <laughs> but the more we trust the Lord and the longer we live, we start saying, all right, Lord, I know now you may not get me out of everything, just, just get me through it. And that's good, you're, you're beginning to grow. But the more you grow, you begin to learn, hey, I grow in Him when I'm in the midst of these trials. Lord, I don't want to be in trial any longer than necessary, but while I'm here, don't just get me out of it or get me through it, but grow me in this. But the ultimate is to say, Lord, get glory from this. Whether you get me out of it or not, no matter what happens, I want you to get glory from this. That's easy to say, easy to preach, not so easy to live. But it happens one day at a time. One day at a time. So we've seen the diagnosis, Lazarus is dead. We've seen the decision, let's go into Judea again. We've heard the discussion, thy brother shall rise again. Now finally, let's see the deliverance. Verse number 38. Jesus therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Don't run too fast past that verse. I wonder what went through the Lord's mind when he stood before that cave, grave, with a stone in front of it knowing in days he would be laying in the same kind of place. <laughs> I can tell you what went through his mind. I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> but verse 39, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Now, of course, Martha, ever the practical one, points out that Lazarus has been dead for four days and that by now the corruption of his body has begun and this body probably stinks. But Jesus reminds her of what he has already told her. Hey, God's word doesn't change. You can read all about how God brings you through trials and grows you through trials and all that before you go in the trial. And then when you get in the trial, say, Lord, well, I don't know. Why, why? He said, hey, my word hasn't changed. Remember what I said before, it's still true today. Go back to the book. Read it again. Now verse number 39. Again, Jesus said, Take away the stone, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Now verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So here we hear Jesus' prayer. You know, Jesus had no question but that he was doing the Father's will. He had been able to say in John 8, 29, And he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Hey, can you say that? No, none of us can say that. We want to be able to say that more and more, but Jesus could. He said, I do always those things that please the Father. And so he knew that this was the Father's will for him to raise Lazarus, but he prayed that so that those around him would know that this was the Father's will. He was never out of the Father's will, but he wanted them to know it. Hey, never be ashamed or afraid to let people know that you serve the Lord and that you're doing what you're doing for the Lord. He didn't stand there and say, okay, I'm going to do this. Everybody's going to see what I'm doing. He said, I want them to know that the Father has called me to do this. Let people know that. Now let's read verse 43 and 44. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Then saith Jesus, or Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. What an amazing couple of verses. You know, you could go out to the graveyard today where your loved one is laid and you could stand there and call their name till you're blue in the face and nothing's going to happen. But the resurrection and the life can say, Lazarus, come forth, and he's coming out of that grave. <laughs> he's the only one that can do that. And one day he's going to call all who have trusted him to come forth. 
The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together and meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That day's coming. Only he can do this. What a thought that this universal fear of ours can be conquered by the creator of life. The book of Job is considered to be one of, if not the oldest books in the Bible. He probably wrote it around the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then, even as far back as that, Job understood this fear of death. But under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he gives us one of the most hopeful and victorious passages in all the Word of God. Listen carefully to Job 19, verses 23 through 26. He says, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. That they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. <laughs> what an amazing testimony. By the way, Job, your words were written in a book. They were graven in the stone for all ages for us to see and hear. That's possibly one of the oldest things ever written. And we have a man looking forward. And he's saying, I know that my Redeemer liveth. He's going to stand on this earth at the last day. And me, though, though my body's already been eaten, he said, I'm going to see him in my flesh. What a wonderful truth. He said, I know my Redeemer liveth in my flesh, I shall see God. You know, the decomposition of Lazarus' body had already begun, but Christ raised him up. And we may be dead and buried a hundred years, and nothing but bone or dust is left of us, but we shall see God in our flesh if we've trusted Him. As we conclude, let's see the results of it all. Verse 45, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. You know, the greatest testimony to the power of the Lord is a resurrected life. We all must give the gospel. We need to give a track or open a Bible or invite them to hear the gospel. That's absolutely true. That's critical. But we must also live for the Lord in front of others. The fact is, we're all born dead in trespasses and sins. Matter of fact, we were more dead than old Lazarus was. He was just dead physically. <laughs> we're born dead spiritually. But the Bible says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. When you walk that resurrection life, listen, when, when Lazarus came out of that tomb, listen, when they rolled that stone away, it was so Lazarus could get out and people could see his life. In a few days, they're going to roll the stone away from Jesus' tomb, but it's not to let him out. It's to let us in so we can see he's not there anymore because he's the resurrection and the life. Physically, yes, but more importantly, spiritually. If you're saved here today, the fact is you have a resurrection life. Are you living it for the Lord? We don't have time to go into it, but the remainder of the passage, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and all those that hated the Lord, they said, hey, we got a problem here. This guy's raised somebody from the dead. Everybody's going to follow him. What are we going to do? And old Caiaphas, the high priest, he said, man, you don't even know what you're talking about. Just kill him. It's expedient for one man to die to save all the people. They said, hey, if we let him go on, there's going to be this uprising. They're going to throw us off. We won't have any power. Rome will come and take away our place and, and our authority. What are we going to do? Caiaphas said, I'll just kill him. He said, it's expedient that one man die for the people. And the Holy Spirit says he didn't even know what he was saying. But that's exactly what was going to happen. So you see, the fact that Lazarus was brought out of that tomb was a glorious thing. But other people saw it and they said, hey, we got to do something about that. And from that moment, the conspiracy begins. we got to take care of this Jesus problem. Listen, folks, if you're saved today, you have a responsibility to live that resurrection life in front of others. That doesn't mean walk around with your nose in the air. That means saying, hey, listen, I'm just as wicked as you are. I was on my way to hell just like you were, but he saved me. He's changed me, and he can do it for you too. Father, we thank you so much that the Lord Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. And Lord, we are excited to know that should we die before the rapture happens, we will rise again and, and Lord, we'll be resurrected and, and we're excited to know that. But more importantly than that, to know that spiritually we can be made alive 
and live that resurrection life. But Father, there are people with us today going through trials. They're going through hardships and heartaches and they don't understand why. Lord, you know all things and you know the reason. And you will not reject us for bringing our questions to you humbly. And your Holy Spirit can bring comfort. So I pray, Lord, that you would help us during these few moments to come humbly before you and bring our questions in Jesus' name. As we stand together, this altar is open. And I want to ask if you would to come to the altar. I want to take some time to pray for all these folks that are suffering. We need to pray for Miss Lydia.